Bert Vox from the Department of Theoretical and Applied Linguistics here at the University of Cambridge. He's a reader in phonology and morphology. And he's going to talk about uh, crowdsourcing big data in English dialectology. Hello, everyone. Today I'd like to talk about some of the ways in which we can enhance our understanding of macro variation, micro variation, and nano variation in the English speaking world by combining recent advances in online crowdsourcing, geospatial data visualization, and statistical analysis. To give you a quick idea of the sort of material I'll be talking about, I've included here on my title slide a close-up of a plot by my collabor collaborator Marius Yundal of the semi-raw data from an online survey of almost 300,000 English speakers, together with a heat map of response clusters for the same variable by another collaborator, Josh Katz. A few patterns leap to the eye here. The patterning of the northeast with the west coast, the coherence of what we call the south in green and the inland north in blue, and the presence of northeastern islands in Florida, the St. Louis area, and eastern Wisconsin. The raw data plot also reveals that the regional patterns are not quite so neat and tidy as the maps we find in textbooks and the popular press would lead us to believe. But to begin this presentation, I'd like to pull back a bit in space and time and talk about the origin of these maps. <clears throat> when I started teaching dialects of English at Harvard in the mid-1990s, I immediately ran into a problem. Though Harvard makes a point of admitting students from every straight state in the United States, most of them don't have obvious regional accents and those who do tend to lose or suppress them within a week or two of arriving in Boston. <laughs> I therefore became interested in the challenge of identifying the regional origins of people with no noticeable accent, an enterprise that was probably very influenced by my childhood love of Sherlock Holmes. Take, for example, the following video clip. Can you tell me where the Wicked Witch is from in this video? Okay, where was she from? California, okay, anywhere else? Hmm? Kansas. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so we would expect the witch to be American and specifically from Kansas. Um, and superficially, she does sound American. And in fact, the actor playing the witch, Brennan Brown, a male American actor, is American. But two shibboleths, which are what we call linguistic forms that give away an individual's group affiliation, reveal that Brown's voice has been overdubbed by a British actress. First, she says, it's not being easy. Um, <clears throat> where an American would say either it hasn't been easy or it hasn't been easy, but she has been, which is characteristic of British Englishes, including Canadian English and Australian English and so on. Secondly, she says, we go to the cinema a lot. With a long ah in cinema, Americans don't use cinema by and large, and when we do, it has a short a or a schwa. Um, and she has what we call intrusive R between cinema and a, uh, so cinemara, which is common in England, but restricted to New York City and Eastern New England in the United States. A little internet research reveals that the witch's voice was in fact overdubbed by British actress Rachel Edwards. 
Spotting shibboleths in American-British crossover situations is actually relatively easy given the significant differences between the two varieties. But doing the same within the United States and Canada is more difficult. So in 1997, I set about designing a survey to help me discover what linguistic subtleties, if any, distinguish speakers of standard American English today. After five years of administering paper surveys to the students in my Dialects of English class, in 2002, my student Scott Golder helped me to implement an online survey of 122 questions. We hope that the combination of interesting and relevant questions, such as what is your general term for the shoes worn for athletic activities, shown here on the slide, with maps that were refreshed daily to incorporate any new responses received the previous day, would provide regular Americans with incentive to take the survey and recommend it to their friends. This was 2002, two years before Facebook was developed by another Harvard undergraduate, Mark Zuckerberg, and a few more years before the concept of going viral entered the global consciousness. But the survey did manage to attract almost 60,000 respondents an improvement by a factor of 20 over the 2,700 individuals surveyed in the largest previous survey of English dialects uh, conducted for the Dictionary of American Regional English in the 1960s. This footwear question here resulted from my being confused by my friends as an undergraduate at the University of Chicago, uh, who were mainly from the Boston and New York areas, calling sneakers, represented by the red dots here on the map, um, what I would call gym shoes. <clears throat> if you look carefully at this map, you can see a lonely bunch of green dots representing the gym shoes centered around Chicago and Cincinnati. It was comforting after running the survey to learn all these years after graduation that I hadn't been linguistically deviant for Chicago, but rather a victim of the cultural dominance of the Northeast in top American universities. Shortly after relocating to Cambridge in 2006, I began collaborating with our doctoral student, Marius Yundal, on a more ambitious project to move beyond the United States and implement the first large-scale study of world English using Google's new dynamic mapping application program interface, which allows users not only to see their own responses, but also to zoom in on local details to a degree that was not possible previously. I had two main goals for this project. First, to develop a sense of whether American or British English is dominant on the world scene. And second, to use the large volume of data collected to predict where an individual had grown up based solely on a small number of linguistic variables. As far as the first point goes, we have found that it is the British pattern that tends to predominate in world English as you can see for the pacifier or dummy on this slide. Here, dummy in blue is used almost exclusively in the British Isles as well as South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, whereas North America has a handful of distinct forms such as pacifier and binky and nookie and variants thereof. As for the second goal, which I call predictive localization, our first step in this direction came when my former student, Emily Tucker, demonstrated in 2007 that it was possible to develop a decision tree based on the information theoretic concept of mutual information to narrow down a speaker's place of origin to roughly a five state area with a degree of accuracy five times greater than one would expect by chance using just seven questions from the Harvard Dialect Survey. Then, early in 2013, a doctoral candidate in statistics at North Carolina State University named Josh Katz constructed a superior method for visualizing the data from the Harvard Dialect Survey using K-nearest neighborhood smoothing with a Gaussian kernel. And in this slide, you can see how Josh's visualization pulls out the region where the second person plural pronoun is y'all in the hot orange area, basically the south, 
uh, more clearly for the casual observer than does the raw data plot in the upper right-hand corner of the slide. You can also see that the Miami area here um, does not share the southern yawl form, a uh, fact we will return to later. Then in December 2013, Josh made a great leap forward, combining his heat mapping with an improved algorithm for predictive localization, which made it possible to effectively identify the place of origin of American respondents with a surprising degree of accuracy using just 25 questions. This combination of compelling graphics and predictive power made the quiz the most read piece of content in the history of the New York Times with more than 21 million individuals taking the quiz. <clears throat> but what can we do with the masses of linguistic data collected in this way? First, we can identify macro variation patterns in world English with a degree of precision not previously possible. For example, in this family chart here, Jane is Damon's Okay, I hear aunt and I hear aunt from the, the Ireland contingent. <clears throat> in this plot of responses in the British Isles, we can see that the original short A in ant is preserved in the green areas covering Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and the north of England, beginning from the Manchester commuting zone. Southern England predominantly has long ah, represented by the blue dots, so aunt. And can anyone tell me what the American form is for this word? Okay, aunt, let's see about that. <clears throat> the East Anglian long ah in aunt was brought to the Boston area in the 17th century and survives in New England today, as shown by the blue area in the upper right corner of the map. The rest of the US emphatically prefers the short A variant in keeping with its historical ties to the Scots-Irish and to Northern England, except mysteriously in Minnesota and the Dakotas and Virginia. Uh, I don't know what's going on with those yet. A uh, second advantage of our dialectological big data is that we can identify and localize micro variation in English dialects to an extent not previously possible. Take, for example, question six on my current survey. What do you call the little gray or black or brown creature that looks like an insect but is actually a crustacean and rolls into a ball when you touch it? The one depicted here. What do you call it? Okay, I have Slater, um, again, the Irish contingent. I have Roly-Poly, what else? Woodlouse. Wood okay. So far, we have received almost 80,000 responses to this question on my current survey, including a whopping 161 <laughs> unique terms, um, ranging from my own doodle bug, which is characteristic of southeastern Texas and southern Louisiana, to Cheesy Bob in Guildford, <laughs> Monkey P in Kent, and Parsons Pig on the Isle of Man. Most Brits call it a woodlouse, but our survey turned up quite a number of local variants in Britain as well. So, it's of interest to me that none of uh, the British forms show up in any numbers in the United States, which is not the normal pattern. Um, though the Scots-Irish Slater is common in Australia and New Zealand. It's also interesting that most of the non-standard terms here are in the southern half of the Isles, where normally the dialectological action is going on in the north these days. Um, <clears throat> Our survey results also enable us to trace a further aspect of microvariation, the fine-grained borders of isoglosses. Take, for example, what we call the cot-caught merger, which refers to varieties of English that merge the vowels in C-O-T and C-A-U-G-H-T. This slide up here presents for this feature Bill LeBeau's data 
collected by telephone from 506 Americans. Note how much of the South and West are blank, and the remaining areas seem fairly homogenous. If we look at the data for the same question from the Harvard Dialect Survey, though, we find what appears to be a more complicated picture with significant mixes of merger and non-merger speakers in areas that appear to be unanimous in Lebeau's plot. <coughs> Coherent patterns strikingly similar to Lebeau's do emerge, though, once we apply Katz's statistical techniques to draw out regions in the data. On this slide, we can see that the two vowels generally merge in the western half of the US, as well as in the Appalachian region around Pittsburgh and in New England. We can also see a bit more clearly than with Lebeau sparse maps that American isoglosses often do not align with state boundaries. So for example, Minnesota is bisected by the Cot-Cot merger uh, isogloss, as are New York and Pennsylvania. The alignment of Lebeau's results from a controlled sample with our findings from a publicly available uh, survey provides some degree of assurance that large-scale crowdsourcing can provide valid results, provided that the questions and answer options are such that random English speakers can interpret and respond to them reliably. The validity of our findings has been further confirmed by comparison to site-restricted web searches by Jack Reeve and Tweet Corpora by Gabriel Doyle. For example, forensic linguist Jack Grieve at Aston University has found by computing local spatial autocorrelation maps for items such as tennis shoes versus sneakers, shown here, that the regional lexical patterns that emerge from the Harvard lex uh, dialect survey data, abbreviated up here as HDS, correlate closely with the patterns revealed by restricted searches of online newspaper archives, labeled SRWS here. In this slide, we can see that sneakers predominates in the Northeast and tennis shoes in the rest of the country, with the isogloss border following in virtually the same area in both corpora. The same can be seen here when comparing the findings for garage sale and yard sale in Greaves corpus. In addition to micro variation of the sorts just discussed, our big data can shed light on the nature and extent of nano variation or variation between individuals in the English speaking world. Take, for example, question four from my current survey. What do you call the kind of crustacean that looks like a tiny lobster and lives in lakes and streams? What do you call it? Crayfish, crawfish, crawdad, anything else? Okay. My word for this, crawfish, comes from my childhood in Texas. Brits tend to call it a crayfish. There are hundreds of terms for this creature in the English-speaking world, though, especially in the United States. Many Americans are exposed to more than one of these terms, which triggers a phenomenon we call synonymy avoidance. Numerous psycholinguistic experiments have found that children assume that a new word to which they are exposed will not be synonymous with any words which um, they already know, which when the new word actually is a synonym of the, an existing lexical item, typically leads to the new word being assigned a sub-meaning of the original word. This can be seen in the range of outcomes of the crawfish words in the United States. So here we have, for example, a few respondents indicated that they spell the word crayfish, but they pronounce it crawfish. Um, quite a large number of respondents use one of the terms for the animal when it's alive and a different one of them for when it's cooked. And most interestingly to me, uh, at least one respondent said that crawfish was singular and crayfish was plural. <laughs> Our megadata also can reveal higher level patterns of stability and change in dialect regions and make it possible to discern correlations between multiple isoglosses and sociocultural regions. Consider, for example, Hans Kurat's famous finding that American English varieties fall into three groups, correlating with the settlement history of the country, the North, the Midlands, and the South. 
What has become of these in the 65 years since Karat's book appeared? We might expect from listening to the speech of Harvard students or to the media that these traditional regional patterns have all gone the way of the outhouse and the icebox. Um, surprisingly, though, our work suggests that the North, South, and Midlands are alive and well as linguistic regions today. Let's consider first the terms for crawfish. Here we can see that northerners predominantly pattern with Brits in using crayfish, southerners use crawfish, and midlanders tend to opt for a crawdad. The same pattern emerges if we aggregate all of the patterns that emerge in the Harvard dialect survey as a whole. The map of the US shown here employs a GITIS or GI local spatial autocorrelation analysis to identify underlying patterns of regional variation. A GITIS or analysis is a spatial statistical technique that identifies a significant, uh, significant patterns of spatial clustering in the values of a variable measured over a series of locations. By comparing the value of a linguistic variable at each point to its values at nearby locations, <clears throat> This algorithm can identify clusters of locations where the values of that variable are significantly higher or lower than we would expect if the values were distributed across the locations at random. These findings are then subjected to a factor analysis and a cluster analysis, yielding, in our case, four statistically distinct dialect regions in the United States today which correlate quite nicely with the traditional regions of the Northeast in green, the Inland North in blue, the Midlands in yellow, and the South in red. Note that the Western half of the country, which was settled more recently and heterogeneously than the East, <clears throat> um, is often not assigned by dialectologists to the North, South, or Midlands. Greaves' cluster analysis suggests that in the present day, the West actually patterns predominantly with the North. And you may have noticed in this map that Florida, again, does not cluster with the South, despite its geographic location. This is not an accident. A quick survey of Katz plots of the Harvard dialect survey data reveals that southern shibboleths are typically not shared by Florida, as we can see in the following slides. So here we have uh, terms for when it rains while the sun is shining. Southerners tend to have some variant of the devil's beating his wife for this, but not in Florida. The pronunciation of lawyer, most Americans say lawyer, Southerners say lawyer, but not in Florida. Um, <clears throat> the use of multiple modal constructions is uh, widely allowed in the South, like I might could do that, but not in Florida. Um, what do you call the thing you use to carry your groceries at the supermarket? The main southern term is buggy, but not in Florida. Uh, what do you call the act of um, taking lots of rolls of toilet paper to someone's house and throwing them in the trees in front of the house? In most of the U.S., that's TPing, but in the south it's rolling, but not in Florida again. This can be correlated with the settlement history of um, Florida and the South. This is a plot of uh, patterns of diffusion of log cabin construction in the United States. And there were three main waves correlating with the three, the North, South, and Midlands waves of um, um, settlement of the US. And you can see that from Philadelphia and the Chesapeake Bay area, these uh, techniques moved down southwards, but they didn't extend into Florida which until very recently, roughly the 60s, had too many mosquitoes and was too hot for, for large numbers of people to be willing to live there who spoke English. <clears throat> um, but there's another element to this pattern. There are also southern features that are shared with the northeast. So for example, southerners say sun shower instead of the devil's beating his wife, which is the northeastern form. Um, they also uh, say sneakers, like New Yorkers and Bostonians, not tennis shoes. And this can be connected to what happened when DDT was developed to deal with the mosquito problem, and refrigeration and air conditioning were uh, developed to help uh, English speakers from the north be able to deal with the Florida weather. Uh, they started coming in large numbers to retire primarily from the Boston and New York areas. 
And this migration pattern remains the main vector of population movement in the U.S. as of five years ago. You can see movement from New York to Florida is still the main migration pattern we find. This leads to a cultural distribution in Florida where the coastal areas of the South in particular are Manhattan, Brooklyn, New Jersey, New England, etc. And you can also see this in patterns of mobile phone calls. The most popular areas um, um, to uh, contact each other by mobile phone are actually the Northeast and Florida. So where does all this leave us? <clears throat> Uh, I've tried to suggest that our online crowdsourcing method um, provides, first of all, reliable data comparable to those of traditional methodologies uh, and on an unprecedented scale. Secondly, it enables us to uh, study macro variation, for example, looking at patterns in world English in ways we couldn't before. Um, <clears throat> to look at patterns of isogloss stability with the North and Midlands and South, to um, identify areas of conspiracy or overlap or alignment between uh, different isogloss regions, um, like we saw with the South, um, to look at micro variation in ways that were difficult before, um, <clears throat> as we saw, for example, with the um, um, commuting zones we looked at briefly and to look at nano variation, as we saw um, with the terms for crawfish and ways of avoiding having two uh, synonyms in contact mean the same thing. And where will we go from now? My immediate plans are to implement a 600 question mega survey, which is now ready to go, it just hasn't been mounted, and then to use the information from this to be able to um, apply predictive localization techniques to the entire English-speaking world, not just the United States. Thank you.